many have had dreams in your life? Nobody's a dreamer. You know, we, we get, we all have dreams. And, and, you know, some dreams, we dream about becoming nurses, or we dream about becoming teachers. We dream about what we want to do in, when we get older. And, and, and young people, girls, young girls, we start dreaming about who we want to marry. Now, I don't know about the boys' side of it, but I know when I was young, when I was 15, 16, I started thinking, what kind of man do I want to marry? I had a dream of who I wanted to, to marry. And, you know, we, we, life is filled with dreams. But, you know, there's a dream, if you will, that was put on your life the day of conception. Wow, it's quiet in here. And this is not even in my notes because on my way to church, I was praying. I said, God, I said, I want you. I don't want it to be what I've written down. I don't want it to be, you know, what I want to say. I want God to speak through me. So first thing I want you to do, I want everybody to stand up for a minute. And I can see all these ladies thinking, oh, my goodness. <laughs> now I want everybody to open your arms like this. Just as wide as you can. Now tilt your head back and say, God, I surrender. Say it again. God, I surrender. All right, you may be seated. See, that wasn't so bad. That was not so bad. And what I had you just now, what I asked you to surrender to, is I asked you to surrender to the dream, to the plan that God has for your life. Because everyone sitting here has a plan. Everyone sitting here has, God has ordained you of what he needs you to do. Now, some of you are sitting there thinking, Cindy, I think you have absolutely flipped your lid. Well, let me tell you something. Don't talk to my husband. He'll tell you I have, and I did 25 years ago. But anyway, teenagers, I want you to listen to this today. Younger kids, middle school kids, I want you to listen because God has a plan for you too. You don't have to wait. You know, God called me to be a preacher when I was 13 years old. Now, I didn't start preaching at 13. Because I was like any other teenager. I wanted to have my fun. I wanted to be with the in crowd in school. I wanted to do what I wanted to do. But let me tell you something. You can run. You can run. You may think you're running to the ends of the earth. But my Bible tells me that we cannot go anywhere that God is not. You know, my son, my uh, stepson, I have a stepson that, and some of you know his story, that he spent... Two years in prison. And you know, I, and when he first went into prison, he thought he had really did it, that God was going to leave him alone. Well, you know what happened? He ended up cornered where he couldn't run anymore, and then he got to listening to God. And when he got to listening to God, he realized the dream that God had for his life. And he started studying. Let me tell you something. You can run, but you can't hide. Because God knows where you're at. And, and teenagers, God has a calling on your life. I'm not telling you that you're going to be on the praise and worship team. I'm not telling you that you're going to be teaching a Sunday school or whatever class. I'm not telling you you're going to stand up here and you're going to be. But you know what? Every one of us, if you are a Christian, you have a calling on your life that you are supposed to be living the Christian life. That is a calling on your life. Because, you know, sometimes we are the only ones that, we are the only Bible that some people see. And if you go around thinking it sounds cool to say, I'm a Christian, because I did it when I was younger. You know, I, I got in with the, the, the church crowd, but I also got in with the worldly crowd. And, you know, I said, well, I'm a Christian. My daddy's an evangelist. I sing every weekend. We're busy singing every, I, I, 
But you know what? I wasn't living up to my calling because I was not living the Christian life. If you accept Jesus Christ in, as your Savior and, your, and He comes into your heart, your calling right then and there is you need to start living the life in front of everybody. Don't expect your children, parents, to live the life if you're not going to live the life in front of them. Just Wednesday night in class, my daughter, I mean, she shocked me. I, I don't know if it showed on my face when she was talking. But, you know, I, I had gotten to the point where I felt like I, I wasn't going to quit praying. But I felt like I was getting nowhere. But she sat right there in, in, in our class Wednesday night, and she said, I know if it wasn't for the the People in my life, like my mom and my dad and my grandparents, she said, if I, I know if I didn't have that spiritual leadership that I would not be here tonight. She said something to that effect. And, you know, and that, that brought me up because God showed me that the dream I have for her and for my son, that it's worth praying for. Friends, it's worth it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4, and I'm going to quote it out of the Amplified Bible. It says, brothers and sisters, beloved by God. You know, that ought to make you excited. That ought to make you excited because it says that you are beloved by God. You are beloved by God. It says, we know that he has chosen you. And, and it says, your election is by God. Your election, what do we do when we... We vote, we are electing somebody into office. Well, you know what? When you accept Jesus Christ, he has elected you to do something. And, you know, I tell my, the, the ladies in, in our class on Wednesday nights, I said, you may not be a teacher, you may not be a preacher, but you know what you can do? You can pray. You are a prayer warrior, whether you th believe you are or not. If you can pray, then you can fight a battle. If you can pray, you can live the dream that God has brought you to, to, that he wants you to do. My big idea is without a dream or a vision, we would not see the glory of God. How many times have I heard when I'm driving the bus, I, especially my high school route, because some of them sit right behind me, believe it or not, some do sit on the front seat, and I hear them talking, and they'll be talking to each other about their day, and I have heard... In the 10 years that I've been driving a school bus, I've heard numerous times one kid will say to the other, there's just no hope for me. And, and you know, and, and that, that saddens my heart because I'm like, yes, there is hope. Jesus Christ is hope. You may feel like there's no hope, but there is hope in Jesus Christ. Without a dream, we would not see the glory of God. You know, God's glory manifests in, in many ways. And one, one thing I, I want to tell you, I, I want to talk to you about a man. And this man, he's, he's not talked about a lot. At least I haven't heard him talked about a lot. I mean, he is known. And I'm talking about a Bible man. He is known. But we're not going to talk about what he's known for. I want to talk about... The Bible doesn't give much history on him, but you know, when, when I was praying and studying, I felt like this is, like God wanted me to bring some of this out, because as I've told the ladies in, in the class, I, I have an imagination when I read, I see what I read, and if there's, if I don't have all the information, I pray, and I, I ask God, God, you know, give me an idea of what it might have been like. So I want to talk to you about a man, and he was chosen. Not only was he chosen by God. He was chosen by Moses. In Numbers chapter 13, he was chosen. And I believe, because there's not much history on this man, but I believe that God chose him. God knew what his destiny was going to be. God put a dream in his heart. It says he was chosen as one, he was chosen the one from the tribe of Ephraim to go and spy out the promised land. We all know the story of how God led the children of Israel out because they'd been enslaved in bondage for, I don't know, hundreds of years. And God, they prayed and they prayed and they prayed and they, they knew that God, was, there was a prophecy that God was going to send a deliverer. This man was born in captivity. This man was born. That's all he knew. All he knew was, was the, the bitterness and the hatred and all of that that slavery brings. And his name was Joshua. And we have to understand 
that Joshua had a history just like you and I have a history. And I'm going to kind of tell you what I think his history was that, that's not recorded. But like I said, he was born as a captive in Egypt, and all he knew was the harsh reality of slavery. However, I like the howevers and the buts in the Bible because usually that means there's something else that's going to tell you something. But Joseph had a dream in his heart, and the dream in his heart as he was growing up was the promise that God was going to send a deliverer. He dreamed of that day that he, not only did he dream of the deliverer, he dreamed of setting his feet in the promised land that God had promised the children of Israel. Friend, let me tell you something. When you have a dream, when God gives you a dream, you need to strive for that dream. You need to hold on to that dream. You need to fight for that dream because that dream is going to set your feet in the promised land, whether it's in heaven, but I'm talking about there is a reward at the end. If you follow through, you will understand what it's all about when you follow through with that dream, when you fight for it. Because let me tell you something. You're going to have people standing around. When I finally went... And I told my dad, I said, Dad, I said, I feel like God's calling me to preach. And I'm so young. Number one, my dad never did discourage me. But I went to other, I went to our pastor that we were in the church we were in, and I said, you know, because, you know, you don't want to study under your dad. You don't want dad to teach you, you know. He teaches me all my, everything else. I don't want him to teach me this. Well, I went to our pastor, and I, and I, and I went to some, uh, our youth director, and I'll never forget. Because they told me, uh, they didn't try to discourage me, but they told me, they said, well, Cindy said, this is the deal. I said, you really, it's going to take years before you can get behind a pulpit. And I said, You're gonna, it's going to take years because you've got to do You've got to study. You've got to, and what they were talking about was like study in a seminary or, or study under them. And, and you've got to have a degree. And, you know, I'm like, Peter didn't have a degree? <laughs> I mean, come on. You know, and, and, but, but they, 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 they talked to me, and, they, and, they, and it discouraged me. And, well, maybe you're not ready is what they would tell me. Well, maybe a few more. But you know what? So I let, it, I let it bother me when I was 13, 14 years old. 16, when I turned 16, my dad, one day we were talking and we were practicing singing, and all of a sudden, Dad turned around and looked at me. He said, when are you going to do what God told you to do? And I said, well, Daddy, I'm not ready. He said, you know what? If God says you are, you are. He said, so, because we were in revival, and he said, tonight, you're going to preach youth night at, at the revival. And I was like, oh, really, Dad? And he said, yeah. Because my dad listened to what God said. Because, and, and I could have said, nah, dad, I'm not ready. But you know what? Immediately I started saying, because I had something in my mind that, see, that's the way God does. He'll have something going on in your mind, and he'll confirm it with you. But I, I went ahead and I did it. But, but like I said, Joshua had a dream in his heart of, and as, of, of a deliverer. And as he grew up, little did he know that God had chosen him, Joshua, for a great destiny. Oh, he was not the deliverer. He is not the one who delivered them out of Egypt. But if you know the story, and we're going to get to this, that part of the story, I think, but at the end, Joshua is the one who led them into the promised land. It says, and one... He, that God had, had, a, had chosen him for a great destiny, one that would help him fulfill his dream of being delivered. And my first reason to pursue your dream is God chooses you for this dream. He doesn't choose anybody else. You know, when he called me to preach, I, I, said, I said, God, you know, Daddy's a whole lot better, or, or you know, Lena's the oldest, why doesn't she? Or, you know, and, and, and there's other things, not just the preaching, but there's other things that God has put on my heart. And I said, God, I'm not equipped for that. I'm not ready for that. Somebody else can do it better. But let me tell you something. If God tells you that he needs you to do something, then you better do it because that, it, somebody else may not be equipped to do it. We find in Exodus chapter 17 that God had gifted Joshua. 
that God gifted him to be a man of battle. Because Moses had, had chose him and told him to gather an army to fight the Amalekites. And the battle was, was being won. Joshua went and he gathered. So Joshua knew. He, he had the strategy. He knew how to do battle, physical battle. And so he went and he gathered them. And as long as, 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 long as Moses had his arms up, the battle was being won. But then his arms got tired. And as his arms came down, they'd start losing. And they, Aaron and, and I, uh, I think it's El- Eleazar, I didn't write that down. But, but anyway, some of them came and they lifted him up and they set him on a rock and, and they got to holding his hands up. As long as his hands was up, they were winning. You know, I had you open your arms and I had you say, I surrender. As long as your hands are up. Because when your hands are up, that means you're reaching for what God has for you. You're reaching for what God's going to give you to fulfill the dream that he has destined you for. Supernaturally, they won the war. And Joshua, that wasn't the only one. If you, if you recall in Joshua chapter 10, he supernaturally won another battle when the sun stood still in the sky. Joshua didn't do that. That was supernaturally done by God. And my second point is God supernaturally gifts you with what you need for the dream. So don't sit there and say, well, I don't have anything to work with because God will give you what you need. He will gift you with what you need to do. Proverbs 18, 16 says, A gift opens the way and ushers the giver into the presence of the great. God will give you what you need. So there's no excuses. By the time I'm done, I'm gonna fi- you're going to find out that there's no excuse for not listening to what God is, is asking you to do because he has a dream for you. He knows the plans that he has made for you, and he knows how, what it's going to take to get you there, and it's time that we put down our excuses. It's time that we start looking to God, and we, it's time that we start opening our arms and say, I surrender, God. I surrender. You give me what I need. You give me the gifts that I need to do what you've asked me to do. I surrender to you. You know, Joshua could have sat like, like some of the other slaves that was in Egypt, and he could have sat there and he could have whined every day. Or he could have said, well, God, I don't understand why you're not sending this deliverer. We've been in bondage all this time. When are you going to send somebody? You know, I was doing a, a, a kind of a research on Joshua, and the Bible, not the Bible, the researchers, the, they say that they believe that Joshua was born around the time that Moses killed the Egyptians. And if you remember the reason Moses... The reason Moses had to flee Egypt is is because he killed the Egyptian. But yet, they say that they believe that Joshua was born around that time. So when God had set Moses where he needed to be because Moses did what he did, God says, okay, I can work with this. And so he sent Moses out into the wilderness, and then Joshua was born. And God looked at Joshua, and he says, this man is going to be one who's going to help deliver my children. This man is going to be one, the one, or one of the ones that's going to take my children into the promised land. This man is going, if he will abide by me, he is going to be a great man in the eyes of Israel. He's going to be a great man. And if you read the story, and we're going to get to the part where they went out and spied, but let me tell you something. If you read in, in Numbers, it doesn't, when they're talking about all of the, the, the Caleb is the one who stands up and says it. It never mentions Joshua, except it said that he stood with Caleb. And there's another section where God has set down his judgment to Moses. He said, this is what's going to happen. And God said, Caleb will be spared. But let me tell you something. Joshua was working. See, you don't have to be in the prime light. You don't have to be in the spotlight like a lot of people think you need to be. You don't have to be on TBN with a million dollars worth of equipment up around you. You don't have to be standing up here on the stage of Eastside Community Church. Your stage is out there. Your stage is at your job. Your stage is when you're cooking supper for your family. Your stage is when you are sitting with your children talking. That is your stage stage that is where you are going to be a deliverer that is where your dreams can come true because you've got to hold on and your stage is before whoever God set you before 
I tell you, I get, I get excited thinking about, you know, so I don't have to be up here. I don't have to do anything. You know, that was told to me one time by a preacher. He was teasing with me because he asked me if I'd preach. I said, well, I'm not really. Well, you don't have to do anything. Well, let me tell you something. God has a, a dream on your life right now. Everyone sitting here, and you don't have to go after it. Do you hear what I just told you? You don't have to go after it. You can come in on Sunday mornings. Oh, my goodness. You can come in on Sunday mornings, and you can sit in your same seat that you're sitting in, and there's nothing wrong with that because I sit in the same seat every Sunday too. But you know what? You can sit there, and you can stand up because the pastor said stand up because we're fixing to do praise and worship or we're fixing to pray, you can stand up and you can look like that on the outside and you can sit down on your seat and you can listen to what the pastor's saying or whoever's bringing the message and you can sit there and you can, in your mind, you're thinking about, well, when I get off, when I get out of church, I'm going to go to Pizza Inn, I'm going to get some of the buffet, I'm going to fill up myself till I'm just overflow. And you can sit there because let me tell you something, excuses and distractions are not in... They're, they're in high, whoa, what word am I trying to say? They're plentiful. Because let me tell you something. The devil's sitting there right beside you. And he's whispering in your ear trying to get you not to pay attention to what God is saying. And when it comes to when you realize what God has put, the calling God has put on your heart, whether it's just to be a prayer warrior, if it's time for you to go into your war room, if it's time for you to set, shut off the TV and get rid of the cell phone and Facebook and the computer, and it's time for you to get on your knees because you said, okay, God, I'm going to pray at, at 6 o'clock every evening. I'm going to get off by myself, and I'm going to say, I'm going to pray to you. I'm going to pray for those that you put on my heart. You know what's going to happen at six o'clock every evening somebody's gonna show up to your house at 5 59 your cell phone is going to ring at 5 59 and you're going to be on the phone for an hour and a half something's going to happen at 5 59 because satan's going to make sure it happens but you know what? We need to start being like my grandparents was. My grandparents, if you was at their house, if we come up at, say, church started at 6, if we showed up at 5.30, they'd say, well, you know what? We're going to church, and if you're here, you're going with us. And then we can visit after church. And I know a man that he had a, a, a prayer time. And sometimes it would, I, I believe, I think he took, I mean, he had a, 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 a regular prayer time, but one weekend from Friday morning to Sunday night, he would steal away and he would spend time with God in prayer. And, and, and I, 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 he, he'd always take his Bible with him by what I understand. And you know what? If you went to their house to see him, his wife would say, well, you're going to have to wait because he has, he's back in the back in his prayer time. It didn't matter to him. If you invited him to a dinner or to a play or to something and it happened to be on that weekend, he wasn't going to be there. Because his time with God was important. Friend, let me tell you something. Joshua was dreaming of a deliverer. And if you, I believe that Joshua, he was brought up. He knew the customs and he knew the, he knew the law. Uh, he knew because the laws had not been written yet. But he knew what God had done. He knew about the creation. He knew what his parents had taught him. He knew and he also knew what the Egyptians were trying to teach them. And, but yet Joshua was steadfast with God and he knew and he stood up there and he said, I know that there's going to be a deliverer and when the spies came back to report what they had found Joshua stood with Caleb and if you remember Caleb and Joshua looked at looked at Moses and the people and he they said let's go do this God has given us this this is our land God has given us this land and yeah we went and looked 
And it is. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. And, and what they were talking about, it was plentiful. There was food and, and, and everything was so plentiful. Of course, it was inhabited by some evil people. But yet Caleb and Joshua knew that Joshua stood up and, and Caleb stood up. And they said, let's go get it, boys, because God is with us. God is going to take us through. But you know what? We sit there and, and we're a whole lot like the other ten that come back. God tells you to do something, or you'll go spy it out and see what you can do. But we, we like to come back like the other ten. We like to come back because, see, let me tell you what the devil does. We've all heard the saying that we take and make a mountain out of a molehill. Well, that's what the devil likes to do. There may be some obstacles that you have to cross. But, you know, it's just like stepping over a shoe in the, or Tatum's toys that's strung all over our living room most of the time. you got to step over or you're going to trip. Well, you know, when you, when you start pursuing what God has told you to do, there may be some obstacles. And it may be some that you can just step right over and go on. But you know what the devil does? He puts tunnel vision on you. And he puts blinders on you and he makes you see that that obstacle but it doesn't look like it's this little anymore it looks like it's huge well I'll never get over that I will never get over that and then we sit down and we quit and see that's what happened to Caleb and Joshua because they told us that we know we can take it God is with us if God is with us who can be against us the Bible tells us that he, he says, I will never leave you. He goes with us all the way. Oh, yes, we're going to have trials. And, yes, we're going to have troubles. But let me tell you something, friend. You don't have to walk through that trials and troubles alone. We're going to have heartaches. We're going to have sorrow. We're gonna have, we are going to have times that we're going to sit down and we're going to say, God, why am I here? Why do I have to go through this? But let me tell you something. I have found in those times if I will still myself and I will listen to what God is telling me when this trial or whenever this is all over, I find out that it it has made me grow in God. It has helped me more in fulfilling the dream that God has, has given me to fulfill. But the other ten, they doubted. And they not only did they doubt, have you ever noticed how doubters, they don't keep it to their self? Sometimes I just wish they just shut their mouth and go on. But yet they got to tell you know, I may come up to somebody and I may say, you know, I believe that God wants me to do this. Well, you doubt. But you don't tell me you doubt. Oh, yeah. That sounds like a good idea. And then you walk right across the, the chapel to somebody else and you'll say, Cindy just told me the craziest thing. Shit ain't going to happen. There's no way she can do that. And then before you know it, then that one's telling that one. And that one's telling that one. And, you know, these ten men, they stood up and they told the people. They said, oh, yes, it, it is, it, there is lots of food. And the Bible says that they brought home a deal of grapes that they had to carry on poles in between two men. That's how big they was. But yet, oh, those men, those mighty armies, there's giants over there. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. They're just going to step on us and crush us and not even think twice about it. And the people believed them. And the Bible even goes on to say that when Joshua and Caleb stood up again to tell them, no, God promised us. We, you know what they was talking about doing to Joshua and Caleb? They was talking about stoning them. Let's kill them. Let's get them out of the way. These two... You ever notice when the majority is wrong, they're always afraid of, of the minorities? I'm not going to get into politics, but have you ever noticed that the Muslims and all of these other people that is in our, our political areas, they're afraid of the Christian? You can sit there and look at me like that all you want. 
They're afraid of the Christian. That's why they're trying to snuff us out. That's why they're trying to hold us down. Because we are a minority. Believe it or not. But you know what? We have God on our side. We can be like the children of Israel. Brother Odell, we can stand up and say, we can take this land. We can stand up and we can say, you know what, devil? You can come at me all you want. You know, just Wednesday night in class, we was talking, and I don't remember exactly what was said, but we was talking about being, being killed for our, our Christianity. And Sister Jody said, hey, that puts me one step closer. You know, that's the way we ought to look at it. We ought to look at it that it don't matter, and we ought to not be afraid of the devil. You know, Joshua and Caleb, they still stood there. They didn't back down. They didn't say, oh, okay, well, you're right. We won't take it. No, they still stood there and said, I think y'all are silly because y'all don't want to take this when God has delivered it into our hands. Joshua also met with many trials on his journey to the promised land from other kings and other armies. God allows trials to test your dreams. James 1 and 3 says, Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Because we're going to get into this in just a a few more, uh, just a little bit. But it's all done on God's timing. We have to be patient. You know, God may tell you, this is what I want you to do. And, of course, we're going to jump up and we're going to be gung-ho and we're going to say, yes, all right. And it may be next year before it happens. But, you know, we get discouraged. And we think, well, God, I don't understand why it's taken so long. Joshua was the personal attendant to Moses. I don't know if, if y'all knew that, but he, he was. That was his job. While they were out in the wilderness, his job, he attended to Moses. God placed him in that particular place to gain the knowledge that he would need. And he placed him in that particular place to see what kind of patience it was going to take to deal with all of these people. Because I, I honestly, when I read this story, I don't know if I could have been like Moses. I don't know if I could. But Joshua was in a place to learn. Sometimes we have to be in a place of learning before we can do what God has asked us to do. And Joshua was put there, and he, he looked, and he listened, and he seen the first hands of what goes on. Because he would need all of this knowledge to fulfill the dream of the promised land. Joshua learned what he needed to know to lead Israel. He learned what it would take to possess the land. In Deuteronomy 34 and 9, God also provided Joshua with the spirit of wisdom. If you... If you know the story at the end, Deuteronomy, that's where Joshua was fixing to take over the leadership. The Bible says that he was with Moses up on, on the mountain, and Moses was looking over, and he seen the promised land. And God told him, so now you have to, you have to uh, give, you know, let Joshua know, or, or, or put your hands on Joshua and pray for him. And the Bible says that when Moses set, put his hands on Joshua, that the spirit of wisdom came upon him. So that the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord commanded. God provides. You may sit there and say, God, I know what you're telling me to do, but I just don't have the things I need to do it. Lord, I don't have what it takes to do this. Let me tell you something. God will provide what you need. God will provide. You may, he may ask you, you may see somebody that you know needs, needs a testimony, that you know you need to go talk to them. And you're like, God, I don't know that person. They're going to think I'm crazy. Or you might sit there and say, well, God, I don't know what to say to that person. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit goes before us, and he makes a way. I want to tell you, I remember when we hadn't been married very long, 
And, you know, I'd heard him talk about some of the people he grew up with. And, and Bill, he had, he had preached. And I knew, I knew he was restless. I knew he had been restless for a couple of weeks. I didn't know what was wrong with him, but I knew there was something going on with him. And finally, one Sunday afternoon or Sunday morning after church, and, and we, wasn't have, we didn't have Sunday night service, he came to me and he said, Honey, he said, I want to tell you something. He said, God has asked me to go speak to this man. Well, I had heard the name before because I, I had heard him talk about how rough this family is. In fact, they lived not far from where we live now, but they had a, a fence that was probably 8, 10 foot tall, and it was locked all the time. You had to get permission to get on their property, and if they didn't want you on there and you walked on there, he, would he, he told me, he said, Hun, he said, they're, they're just old, good old rednecks that they'll shoot you if they don't want you on their property. Or if you say something that makes them mad, they would just as soon kill you as look at you. And he's telling me this. And, of course, I'm like, really? <laughs> and in my mind, I'm like, I did not discourage him. And he'll tell you, I did not discourage him. But in my mind, I'm like, God, I don't want to be a widow this soon. And I was like, God, why are you sending him? Why don't you send somebody else? But I looked at him as the dutiful wife, and I said, okay, I understand. He told me where they lived, and he said, now I'm going to go. He said, if I don't come back, then you'll know where to start looking. And I said, okay, because we trusted God. And I want you to tell you what happened. He walked up there, and the boys that he knew, they seen him. They knew who he was. And see, he didn't go all dressed up like a preacher. He went in his camos. And he went in what he was comfortable in because he knew that that's what they would accept. And they accepted him in, and he told them. I mean, he told them, he said, God asked me to come talk to your dad. And Bill will tell you, he, he walked in there, and he sat down with this man. This man was, he was deathly ill. He was going to die. I, I, I think he had cancer or something. But he sat down, and he called the man by name, and he said, God's been dealing with me for a couple of weeks to come and visit with you. He said, but I, I didn't come. He said, but I'm here now because I'm tired of, of God whipping me for not being here. He said, so I'm here, you know, to talk to you. And he said, the man started crying. God provided. The spirit went before him. But he said, the man started crying. And he said, I have been praying for two or three weeks that God would send somebody to me to talk to me because I have accepted him but I want to make sure because I know I'm dying and I want to make sure that I did it right if Bill had sat there now I, if he accepted Jesus Christ I, I know he did it right but if he had sat there and not went because he was afraid that to go because he didn't know what lied what lay before him and that man died. That man may have given up on trying to even be a Christian and went back to his old ways before he died and went to hell. Friend, let me tell you something. Don't say this. Say, God, I can't. I don't have the stuff I need. I don't have the knowledge. I don't have the mouth to speak. Moses tried that. Moses said, Lord, I, I got a speech impediment. How am I going to go tell the Pharaoh? God said, all right, I'll make a way. God provided Aaron. God will make a way. But that man, and he just died a few days after Bill had went to see him. But he sat there and he was praying because he was wheelchair. He, did, he could not get out to go anywhere. And he was praying, God, send me somebody. God, send me somebody. God will provide for you in the journey towards your dream. God will provide. He is a provider. Hebrews 13, 21, 20 and 21, and I use the, the New International Version. It says, Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equipped you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in you what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. God will provide for you. So see, there's another excuse that God has thrown out. You can't sit there and say, God, I don't have what I need. 
because God will provide. In Numbers chapter 27, verses 12 through 22, and Deuteronomy 31. See, this one goes in hand in hand to me with, with the, provi- the provision that God does. But God gave Joshua direction. He gave Joshua direction through Moses. Remember I said earlier that, that Joshua was the personal attendant to Moses. And while he was in there doing whatever personal attendants do, he would hear what Moses was. And I believe that there was times that, that he may be in there doing whatever personal attendants do, that he would hear Moses in the other part of the tent praying to God and asking God, God, what do I do next? I believe that he got his directions, a lot of his direction of praying. Because if you read the book of Joshua, before Joshua did anything, he took it to the Lord. He took it to the Lord and he said, God, you show me. You show me how to do this. You show me how to do this. Because I believe that he got that direction by listening to Moses. Because when they would come up against an obstacle, I mean, you all know the story. We would have been taught this from from youth. But when they would come up against an obstacle in the wilderness, Moses would say, God, what do I do? When they come to the Red Sea, and everybody started complaining, well, you brought us out here just to die because we got the water in front of us and we got Pharaoh and his army behind us. So now what are we going to There's nowhere we can go because there's a million and plus of us and, and how are we going to cross this river or this sea? How are we going to do this? And Moses said, God, what do I do? And God said, Moses, what's in your hand? You know, that's another, another part of the provision story that you can look at is God provided for Moses. Because when Moses was out tending the sheep when he fled Egypt, And God spoke to him. You know, you always see the pictures. You always see a shepherd always has a staff. A shepherd always has a stick that he uses. And he uses the stick to grab that one that's straying away. Or he'll use that stick to beat away the wolves and all of the predators that are coming against his his sheep. He uses that stick to help him when he's weary. He uses that stick to help him walk along when he's on an incline, when he's climbing the mountain. Listen to what I'm fixing to say. When the shepherd is climbing the mountain, when, when you are climbing the mountain, you have a staff. You have a staff right here. You have a staff. All you got to do is get it out and use it. And the shepherd, he'll take that staff, and it'll help him walk up that mountain. It'll help him walk up to wherever he needs to go. And when Moses was out tendering his father-in-law's sheep, he had a staff in his hand. And the Bible tells us, if you look at everything that happened in the in the, the wilderness, when Moses, when he prayed to God, the first thing God would say is, what is in your hand? God is telling you, I have given you a dream. And you're sitting there saying, but God, I don't have what it takes to fulfill it. I don't have the necessary tools. If God tells you that he has you a dream and that he's telling you to do something, then, friend, he has already equipped you with what you had. He has already made provisions. And he will set somebody with you or in front of you that can help you and give you directions if you'll just listen and heed. Joshua. Joshua, listen to what Moses did. Joshua listened to what Moses said. Joshua looked to Moses, and he got the directions that he would need to fulfill, taking them on into the promised land. Joshua knew that Moses was the deliverer that had been prophesied about, but I believe that Joshua was beginning to understand that he is part of that delivery, that he is part of that person. He is one that's going to play a part in the deliverance. He's one that's going to play a part because him and Caleb stood up. And he said, we know we can take this land. And that was years before. They didn't have to wander around for 40 years. But Joshua knew, and when it came time for him to step out, he had the directions that he needed to step out and take the land. Why did God provide him the directions? Because he had the faith in the very beginning, we can take this land. God gives us direction on how to go about our dreams. You know, a lot of times we'll sit there and we'll say, well, God, I just don't know how to do that. 
God, I just don't know. I just don't know how to teach little kids. Oh, God, I just don't know how to stand at the door and greet everybody. I'm a shy person. God, how can I be, how can I help out with the Easter egg hunt? Because I don't, I don't know what to do around that many people. Well, you know what? God has already provided you with what it takes to do it. If you'll just step out and at the Easter egg, if you're just going around picking up trash and throwing it in the trash, you're doing a service to the Lord. You're not doing it for Pastor Gary. You're not doing it for this church. You need to be doing it that, for God to say, I want God's place to be beautiful. I want God's place. And I, that's free of charge. I'm not even going to charge you for that. You may say that, you know, you say, well, I'm just, I'm just a 12-year-old girl. And I think God wants me to do something, but I, I just, I'm just 12 years old. How old was Jesus when the first time they caught him in the temple going about his father's business? David was a youth. David was a youth when he was anointed king of Israel. Because he was anointed king of Israel, they called him in from the sheep. They called him in from the fields so that Samuel could anoint him. Let me tell you something. Your age is no excuse. Or you might say, well, Cindy, I'm 85 years old. I live, I don't live by myself. I can't hardly get around. Well, let me tell you something. If God's telling you to do something, you're going to have the strength to do it. You're going to be able to do it because God will provide and God will give you direction. Psalms 32 8 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. You know, if God is calling, if God is telling you, yeah, I, I hate saying the word calling because a lot of times when you talk about God's calling, a lot of times they think, oh, I, I, God's not calling. I'm not going to be a preacher. I'm not going to be no Sunday school teacher. But God has something for all of us to do. And he has had this something for you to do since the day you was conceived. I believe that. And it may not be something great. You may not ever make TV in. But that's okay. You may not... That half of this congregation sitting here may not know what you do. But you know what? That's okay. Because God knows that you have fulfilled what he wants you to do. God knows. And the people that it involves, because, see, God's not going to have you doing something on your own. Because what you do is going to affect somebody else. Just like the story I just told you about Bill needing to go speak with this man. What he did, he even witnessed. He was able to witness to these boys. I don't know where those boys are now, but they know because they had a witness that came to them because God told him to. And let me tell you something. When God tells you or he lays on your heart to do something. There's a reason. And you and God will confirm what you're supposed to do. In Numbers chapter 27, verses 12 through 22, I talked about this earlier. But God confirmed Joshua before all of the people. And this was even, they were still wandering around in the wilderness when this happened. Because Moses was getting so drugged down with all of, because he was the one. He was the one in, in authority. He was the one that if I had a squabble with somebody, if me and Bill got into a squabble, we went to Moses because he was the one. And then if I turned around and I got in a squabble with Lena, we went to Moses with it. If we couldn't settle it ourselves, because that's who was in charge. And Moses was getting dragged, drugged down, and he was getting to where he, it was really weighing down. And God told him, said, 
you choose Joshua. You get Joshua up here. And you are going to give some of your authority to Joshua. And God even told them, said, and after you give you, said, you're going to take him, and you're going to take him before all of the people, and you're going to lay your hands on him, Moses. And then Eleazar, which was the high priest, is going to come along in front of all the people, and he's going to bless Joshua. And the people will know that Joshua was God's chosen. Somebody is going to confirm. You say, and I'm not saying, I may not stand up here and look at you and say, Tracy, you're going to. Because God hasn't told me to do that. But if God is dealing with you to, on something, somebody's going to say something. And just an idle conversation. It's going to come up, and God, and you're going to sit there and say, how did you know? Because God will confirm. God confirms your dreams through other people. If you read on in the book of Joshua, you'll find out that even the mighty kings confirmed Joshua to other kings. Because they knew, they confirmed him by telling the others of how God was with him and how they feared him because God was with him. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Again, I use the, the New International Version. It says, Therefore, my, brethren, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to, com to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never have to stumble. Somebody will confirm you. Somebody will, will say something or do something, and you're going to know, yes, yes, God. It is. You told because it, there's times that God's told me something. And I'm like, hmm, was that really God? Was that really God? God, did you really tell me to do that? Did you really say that to me? And when I'm questioning, somebody will come along, not even knowing what I'm questioning God about, and they'll say something along the lines, or that something will be said that will trigger, and I will know. Yes, God, you confirm this is you. Because we are supposed to try the spirits. We are supposed to try. We are supposed to pray and make sure. And I'm not saying question everything. Because sometimes God hits you with a ton of bricks. It's just like when the coyote is out there chasing the road runner and everything fell. Sometimes that, that bricks fall right on me. And I know God's saying, Cindy, this is what I'm telling you to do. And you need to get up and you need to do it. No more excuses. Because I have provided I have given you direction because that's what God does. Numbers chapter 14, verse 34. This is one, when I was, when I was studying this, this is one of the, the, I have trouble with. And I think we all have trouble with this one. Because... I'm just going to give you my point to begin with before I ever tell you what happened to Joshua. God follows through with your dream in his timing. That's something I struggle with. I think we all do because you know what? We're all fast food people. We have microwaves in our homes. If we don't have 5G internet, then we sit there and complain because it's too slow. Last night, <laughs> the weather was, was messing up, and I had turned over to our satellite t to our TV on our Roku, and I put up Pure Flix because I was going to see if I could find me and Lena a movie to watch, and it just sat there, and it sat there, and it sat there. Even the pictures wouldn't even come up on to choose my movie. And Lena said, something wrong with the Internet? I said, I think it's the weather. And you know what I did? I clicked off of it and went to something else. And when I went to something else, I went to Sling, and it did the same thing. You know what? I, I ended up going back to my regular antenna because it was coming in. That's the kind of people we That's the society we live in. We, it's mine, and I want it now. God, you told me I'm going to do this, so I want to do it now. You know, Joshua and Caleb stood up, and they were right to do what they did because they stood up and said, we can take this land now. 
Joshua, they believe, you know, the, the scholars believe that he was about 40 years old when Moses led him out of Egypt. And for 40 years he had been sitting there. Because remember I told you they believed he was born the day that Moses fled, that Moses killed the Egyptians. But, you know, he, he sat there for 40 years and he'd been hearing mama and daddy and grandpa and grandma and the priest and all of these people say, oh, it's been prophesied that God's going to send a deliverer. It's been prophesied that God's going to take us out of this place. And you know what? Even Joseph, even that was many years before Joshua, Joseph said, when you leave this place, you take my bones with you. You take my bones. And so Joshua, Joseph knew that, he, that there was going to be a deliverer. And yet for 40 years, all he's heard is there's going to be, there's going to be, there's going to be, there's going to be. How easy would it be if I sat here and told you every day, oh, I'm going to. I'm going to give you 100 bucks, Mackenzie. After church, Mackenzie's going to say, where's my hundred bucks, Cindy? And I'm going to say, I'll give it to you next week. Next week, Mackenzie come right back up and she said, where's my hundred bucks, Cindy? I'm going to give it to you next week. And before long, Mackenzie's going to go around telling everybody, don't believe anything Cindy says because she's not going to do it. So it'd be easy to sit there for Joshua and say, for 40 years I've been hearing that there's going to be a deliverer. Well, I'm just going to give up, and I'm going to start serving the Egyptian gods, and I'm going to start doing what the Egyptians want me to do. We sit there, and we don't get what God says at the very beginning because we don't have a microwave, and we don't have a McDonald's and a Burger King standing there, and we're going to sit there. We don't want to stand at that stove and cook a full meal. We don't want to stand there at the stove and wash the pot and wait for the water to boil some of y'all will get that and you we don't want to stand there and wait on those biscuits to get done then we don't want to stand there and start mixing the flour and the oil and the lard and all that goes into making biscuits we want it now we want to go to walmart and buy a whopping can and we want to have whopping biscuits y'all know what i'm talking about don't you we want to go buy that can but you know what anymore? We want to go down the bread aisle and we want to see Hawaiian king on our table because I don't even have to go home and cook it. I can go home, pull them out of the package, slap them on a plate, and they'll be going like that. We don't want to wait. But you know what I have found? That all of the other things that I have mentioned, all of these other things where God chooses us, and he supernaturally gifts us. And he allows us to go through trials to strengthen us. And he provides for us. And he gives us direction. And he confirms us that will not happen in a McDonald's line. That will not happen when you stick that bag of popcorn in the microwave and hit the popcorn button for two and a half minutes. Yes, God can do all of that in two and a half minutes. But let me tell you something. If, he, if we have to sit and wait, you know, I can remember as a kid, I would sit there. I remember the very first job I ever had. I worked at a grocery store. And everybody else was getting their check the first Friday that I worked. But because, you know, I started in the middle of the pay session, I had to wait three weeks before I got paid. And I was anxious and I was sitting there, and I, okay, yeah, here it is, Wednesday of the w payday week, and I'm sitting there because this is my very first paycheck. My very first, I made this myself. I, this is my money. And I sat there, and come Friday, I went to work early. And I went there as soon as I could. As soon as I got out of school, I went there, and I got up there, and I asked the, our head cashier, I said, oh, can I have my check? She said, boy, you're here early. Oh, but I want my check. And she said, you want us to cash it for us? Oh, I don't even have to leave the store because all I had to do is sign it, hand it right back, and I had money in my hand. I was excited. And you know what? We need to be, when God has us in the waiting period, when God has us in the holding period, we need to be excited about what God's doing in our lives because he is preparing you to take the promised land. He is preparing you to step over and to re reap the rewards that you are expecting. And right now, we as Christians are in a holding period because God is getting ready to bring us to the promised land that we are looking for. He is getting ready, but we have to follow his timing 
God follows through your dreams with his timing. Joshua still had to, he had to wander with all of those people for 40 years. Even though he knew they could take it that day. God will test us sometimes. And he has his own timing. And when we wait on the Lord, listen to what I'm fixing to say. When we wait on the Lord, everything is the best that it can be. The blessings flow like milk and honey. Philippians 1 and 6 is being confident of this very thing, that he who began a work, a good work in you will complete it until the day of our Jesus Christ. He's not going to stop on you. He's not going to stop on you. And I just want to give you a little timeline about Joshua. Joshua was 40 years old when he spied out the land. You find that in Joshua. I've, I had it written down. I think it's Joshua chapter 10. But he talks about he was 40 years old when Moses sent him to spy. He was 80 years old when he became the leader of the children of Israel. He was 80 years old when his foot first stepped into the promised land. He was 101 at his most famous battle. The battle he's known for. Because God had provided for him. God had taught him. God had made direction for him when he fought. That's, and he knew to wait on God seven days. They had to wait for that city to come down. And you all know the name of the city. It's Jericho. The city that couldn't be taken. He was 101 at his most famous battle. And, they, and, he, and the Bible, he, it says in there he was 110 years old when he died. He could have given up in the first 40 years of his life and not seen what God did. Friend, God is, he's got a dream for you. Are you dreaming that dream? Are you a dreamer? You say, well, I don't know what God wants me to do. I want to ask you to stand. You say, Sister Cindy, I don't know what God wants me to do. I just come to church, and I do the best I can. I want you today to ask God to give you direction. Because he has something for every one of us to do. It may not be standing up here. It may not be singing. It may not be preaching. It may not be anything like that. But God has something for you to do. Remember, my big idea is without a dream or a vision, we would not see the glory of God. We have to dream big. Because I serve a big God. You know, that's why... That's what this whole series has been about, was being big in areas. We need to have a big dream. We need to have a big dream for our church. Not that we can say, hey, we're the biggest church in Muskogee. But our main goal for our dream, for our church, should be to see souls coming to Christ. Not coming and sitting on the seats. Our goal should be, we want to see souls saved for Christ. I want you to ask God, Lord, show me, show me the dream that you have for me. You said, I know the plans that I have for you, and I'm asking you, ask God to show you what those plans, because God will show you. And then you have to be willing to, to wait, and you have to be willing to allow these things that we just talked about, these seven things to work in your life. Every head bowed, every eye closed.